Right. So let's say that you do, don't know where to start. You are worried. You have limited time. You lost your notes. You lost your textbooks. You lost everything and you don't know what to do. Then you open up on the WCED's website and you look for the exam guidelines. And you will see there that it says grade 12, 2021. 20, and that those are the exam guidelines that you are looking for because those are the ones that are still relevant. All right, and here you can see the exam guidelines. Um, and there it tells you what you need to study when it comes to housing. Um, so you need to know your renting, your building, and your buying. What do I need to know from buying my full title and sectional title? And there it tells you everything I need to know, the advantages and disadvantages, the financial responsibilities, and the contractual responsibilities. So you take the exam guidelines. I always tell my children, you sit, put the exam guidelines next to you, and you look in your textbooks where you find renting, building, buying, and what do I need to study there? All right, as well as when it comes to buying household appliances. In the next session, we are going to look at buying household appliances. And there you can see what you need to know for it for the um, household appliances. We'll get into that a little bit later. And then there you can see that it is question five and that it only counts 20 marks. In this section, this is where you need to score marks. It's easier, it's less work to study, um, and the same with clothing as well. It's 20 marks, so this is where you score marks. And there it also tells you, what do I need to do? I need to discuss and compare the three different housing options. So we're going to look at all of that now. So it's very important that you print this out for yourself or you have it next to you when you study. All right, so the first thing that we are going to look at today is the housing options. So you have three different housing options. You have renting, buying, that we're going to discuss full title and sectional title and building. So one day when you move out of your parents' house and you um, then you can either rent a house or you can buy a house or you can build a house. All right. But before you decide any of those, you will look at the factors to consider when you choose a housing option. So you're not going to close your eyes and you're going to pinpoint on one of those. You will first look at the factors. And the first one that we have there is your finance um, and your social economical status. So what does that mean? You're first going to look at where in society do you fit in according to the amount of money that you earn. That is what that means you're, you're first going to look at your finances. How much money do I have? Then you're going to look at the lifestyle of your family. Are you an outgoing family? Or do you need a garden because you like gardening? Um, do, you, uh, do you need a study because you work from home? How many bedrooms do you need? So you're going to look at the lifestyle of your family. Then you're going to look at the size of the family. I always tell my learners, remember, when we look at this, we always look at the ideal situation. We know that there's lots of situations that are not ideal and that there's lots of people that maybe needs to live in a one bedroom. But when we discuss this, we always look at that ideal world. Uh, so the size of the family. If you have three children, you would ideally want all of them to have their own bedroom. Then you're going to look at the stage in the life cycle of the family. So in grade 11, we did the stages in the life cycle. And in grade 10, we also touched on that, the stages in the life cycle. Are you a growing family or you newlyweds or are you contracting family or are you the empty nest stage where um, so that will also determine what type of housing option you will buy. And then the last one, you will look at your property location. Um, so obviously that will determine where you need to stay. Will you stay far from um, far from work or far from school or, or you want to stay close to school? Uh, so obviously that will um, determine. Uh, where you will good stay morning, and then obviously good morning angie this is kriyaf sorry sorry could we put it in it will be afrikaans and you okay. continue continue thank you 
All right. Um, so your property location, and obviously that will also determine your finances, where you want to stay. If you're going to live in a lower economical environment or you're going to live on the hills of Plateau Clerf. Okay, so those are your factors that you will determine before you buy anything. All right, so let's look at renting. Renting, uh, the payment a tenant make is usually month to month to a landlord for the right to live in that property. That is what renting means. Then very important, and you'll see that this is something that I'll, I will highlight throughout um, the slides, is that you need to know your definitions. So when you have your um, your exam guidelines after you have your exam guidelines you first start off and you study your definitions and that's very important because if you know what a lessee means or what a landlord is then you can answer the question but if you have no idea what that word means it's very difficult to answer a specific question so i'm going to hammer on that is that's very important that you know your definitions all right so there we have our 10 Tenant or our lessee or our renter, and that is all the same thing. So if in a case study they talk about the lessee, you need to know what that means. And that is the person that is renting the property. Then we move on to the landlord. Landlord is also called the lesser. That is the person who rents out the property, the owner of the property. And any type of housing can be rented, a flat or a duplex. Renting units can be furnished, which is obviously more expensive when they already have furniture in or like most, um, they are unfurnished. So there you can see your different housing options. All right. What is renting? There we have it. It's an agreement between the landlord and the tenant should be in place. And what is this agreement? Very important that you know that this agreement is a legal document legal document very important that you know that and that is called that agreement is called the lease and it gives the tenant certain legal rights and responsibilities for the duration of the lease and that is your rental contract and if you don't sign that rental contract then you have no rights and responsibilities so if if they don't offer you a legal or that lease agreement then you you need to ask for it. And it's very important that you sign that, that you have, have a foot to stand on. All right. Then you will determine or they will ask you to pay a deposit. And that amount is required. That is an upfront payment that you're going to pay. So before you move in, they are going to ask for a deposit. And the purpose of this deposit is to protect the landlord from any financial loss um, in case of if there's any damages. Um, the deposit must be paid back to the tenant when they move out. Um, in your textbook, you will also see that it says that the deposit must be put in an interest-bearing account. So they need to take that deposit and they need to put it in an account where interest is, um, is earned so that when you move out, then they can give you your full deposit back and that they don't take um, away any admin fees. Um, so, and you'll see there then, obviously, you will pay rent. So I always tell my learners that you must stay with your parents for as long as you can. Why? Because financially, it is very difficult to move out when you start studying or when you start working to immediately move into a flat or into a house. Why? You need, and, and most um, rental properties will ask you for two months rent. So let's say your rental agreement is 10,000 rand. So in other words, your installment that you're going to pay from month to month from you, that, that is the, the tenant, and you will obviously pay to the landlord, is 10,000 rand. And if they ask you for two months deposit, that is 20,000 rand, in a, plus your first month's installment. So before you can move into a rental place that is 10,000 rand, you are going to have to pay 30,000 rand before you can move into that property. And then obviously you don't have any furniture. You must still pay water, electricity, uh, insurance, um, cleaning aids. There's lots of things that you need to think about before you can actually move into any rental property. So yeah, think twice before you move out. Uh, so if they talk about the finances when it comes to renting, you need to know you pay a deposit, 
you pay uh, and then you pay installments. And then before occupation, the tenant and the landlord should inspect the property together to identify any defects and make a list. And that list is called the snag list. And that is the list that you need to draw up. So you, the tenant and the landlord, or if it is an estate agent that is showing the, you the house, you will walk through the house and you will look at any cracked tiles or any um, broken windows or any taps that doesn't work so that when you move in that the landlord cannot say that you as the tenant broke any of those things so it's very important that you move in with a snag list let's look at the contractual responsibilities so before you move in you will sign that lease agreement. Remember, it's that legal document that you will sign in. And what must be on that legal document? The name and the address of the property, both parties' signatures, the dates which is signed, and the occupation, when to move in, and the period for how long you're going to stay there, any details about renewal, like let's say you only sign it for a year or for two years, uh, then all of that information must be there. And then obviously, very important, the rental amount, you're going to pay that 10,000 Rand. And then a clause indicating all the rights and responsibilities of both parties. For instance, the tenant pays household insurance, um, a little bit later, we're going to look at all the different types of insurances that you must pay. Um, the tenant usually pays its own water, own electricity, and then municipal services as agreed upon. So the owner can tell you that they want you to pay refuse removal or they will pay refuse removal. And all of that must be stated in your lease agreement so that the owner cannot come later and say, but you must also pay for this or you must also pay for that. All right. Um, like I just said, we're going to look at your insurances a little bit later. Um, but the tenant will pay household insurance. So uh, that is something that is vol voluntary. So you don't have to have it, but it's nice to have. So if they break in, then um, that, that will be covered. But the landlord will also pay household insurance if they own a property. So just take note. Uh, that that is the one that you don't have to have, but it's a nice to have. Then the landlord's responsibilities, what do they pay? We're going to look at those insurances now. They will pay homeowners insurance. They will pay life insurance or mortgage bond protection insurance. Um, and they will pay rates and property taxes, and they will pay for any maintenance. So those that is the landlord's responsibilities and the tenant's responsibilities is to pay for the water electricity and if there's any municipal services that are agreed upon. All right, here we look at our insurances. Who pays what? All right, so first of all, that is your bond or your mortgage protection insurance and it actually says it in the name. What insurance is that? It is to pay for the mortgage bond. So if something happens to you, this is life insurance to settle the home loan if something unexpected should happen to the owner. So the house becomes paid upon the death of the owner. The financial institution, which is the bank, will approve the home loan. That, or that, that is approving the home loan will require this. So when you go to the bank, the first thing that they will ask you is to take out mortgage bond protection insurance. So that also covers the bank. So if you go to APSA Bank or you go to Net Bank and you go ask for a home loan and your home loan gets approved, you will have to take out mortgage bond protection. So if you um, if something happens to you as the owner, then that will be paid upon um, if you if you have to if something needs to happen to you. All right. The second one is the one, and that's the one that my learners usually struggle with because it doesn't tell you in the name exactly what it is. So just remember that if you go down to household insurance, that tells you what it is. Household, it covers the household content. So comprehensive homeowners insurance, that is the one that nobody ever knows what it is because it doesn't say in the name what it is. So you must remember that that's the one that you don't know what it is. So it is the short-term insurance that will cover or protect the structure and permanent fixture 
of your house against fire, flood, or any other disasters. So if your geyser bursts and all your cupboards lift up and your tiles breaks and your um, wooden floors lift up, then that insurance will cover for that. Or if your house burns down, your comprehensive home owner's insurance will cover that and if you own a uh, if you own a house you have to have comprehensive homeowner's insurance so the top two you'll see there that is what or the landlord can have all of that but the tenant does not pay for the top two household insurance that is the insurance that covers the content of the home like furniture clothing any appliances against if they break in or if there's a fire or if there's any damage so Please just take note because they love to ask the three different ones. So it's very important that you know who pays what. So the landlord or the homeowner, they will pay the top two um, or the, they can have all three if they live in the house. But you as the tenant just have to have household insurance. So you must know your different insurances. All right. And then you will also see that in every renting, buying, building, um, we will have our advantages and disadvantages. It's very important that you know all your advantages and disadvantages. All right, when you rent, remember you don't own anything. It is a more affordable option for those who cannot build or buy because it's not something fixed. You can move out if you give due notice. So it is more affordable and it's usually a little bit cheaper. So the conditions of the contract are known to both parties from the beginning. So because you signed that lease agreement, um, you know exactly what you can and cannot do. Then the rental amount is fixed. It's not changed by the interest rate. Um, so even if the interest rate goes up or the interest rate goes down, it is the owner that that affects. So they will pay more or they will pay um, less. But the tenant's rental amount is fixed. It doesn't change. But after a year, they can put it up. If you sign for a year, they are allowed to increase it annually. You can run a business from a rental property only if the landlord gives you permission and the municipality. Um, it affords you greater freedom of movement. If you move jobs, if you get a job in Joburg and you quickly need to move, then after due notice, you can, um, in your contract, it will state whether you want um or whether you need one, need to give one month or two months notice, you can move to Joburg. Um, where if you have a house, um, you cannot um, just change. Um, then the landlord is responsible for the maintenance and the insurance of the property. So you don't have to pay for big maintenance. So, so if the geyser burst, the landlord will fix it. Or if um, some a pipe bursts or anything breaks, then um, the landlord is uh, needs to pay that. And then obviously they pay those other two insurances, homeowners and the comprehensive insurance or, and mortgage bond protection. The tenant doesn't pay land and property taxes. Those are your rating taxes to the municipality. Remember that landlord pays that. Then your disadvantages. Um, do not um, benefit or increase wealth as the payment goes to the landlord. So even if you've paid uh, for many years, you've rented many years, you will never have an asset because all you're doing is you're paying off somebody else's bond. The tenant have no guarantee that the lease will be renewed. So it could be that the owner sells the house and you need to move out um, because it's not, um, you don't have any guarantees. The rate usually increases annually. So like I said, um, it can go up after a year. The tenant must comply with the conditions of the contract and get permission from any changes. So you can't just build on or um, change, make any big changes or paint or put up burglar bars because um, you don't have that permission um, and you cannot sell the property to make a profit because you're not the legal owner. You cannot use the property as a security for a bank loan. So how that works is if you go and you want to start a business or you want to buy a second property and you already have a property, you can use that property as a security for a bank loan. So the bank will not just give a loan to anybody. They need some security that if you cannot pay, 
where is that money going to come from? Then at least if you have a, another house, then they know that they can take from that bond that you've already paid off. Or if you start a business and anything, your business doesn't work out, um, then at least they know that they can take from your bond that you've already paid off if you have a house. But if you are renting, you have no security for a bank loan because you don't, don't own anything. And then if you spend on it, any money on the property, uh, it might not be um, reimbursed. So if you put up burglar bars um, and the owner said, no, but I don't want burglar bars on, then they might not pay for it. Or um, they might, might not pay for any, um, if you do any landscaping or anything to your grass or you put trees in, um, the owner might not pay for it. All right. Then, like I said, you need to know your definitions. You need to be able to explain, discuss, and differentiate between all of that. So if you know your definitions, you're already one step ahead because then you can answer all the questions. So there we have our lease agreement. Remember, that's the contract. We have the tenant. You are the um, person renting. Uh, you pay a deposit to the landlord. What is your household insurance? And the fact that you are renting. So those are your definitions that you need to know there. All right, we move on to building. All right, so obviously before you build a house, you need a vacant plot to build on. You need a piece of land that you can build on. Then your house plans must be drawn up by a draftsman or an architect. So a draftsman is usually a bit cheaper um, and they, they can do simple house plans or uh, already existing house plans. Or you can go to an architect. Architects are very expensive, but then they can make invaluable contributions. So they can tell you that this will not work or this is the best layout or you need to move your house. Remember, so African houses must be north facing so they can um, put um, an orientation of the house so they can put your house so that it's north facing. Then before you do anything, the plans must be submitted to the local municipality for approval. Once you approved it, you need the services of a builder or a contractor with a good reputation. So not your neighbor that tells you he's a builder. Then you need to make sure that the builder or the contractor is registered with the National Home Builders Registration Council. So there's another definition that you need to know, the NHBRC, you need to know that it stands for your National Home Builders Registration Council. So they're not allowed to build a house if they don't belong to that council. Then obviously you need finances for building. And you can obtain that by applying for a home loan. So again, you will go to the bank and you will ask for a home loan because that house must still be built. Then they will send building inspectors to regularly check the building to make sure that they're building it, um, that the house plans and the building is the same um, and that they're using the correct material and that they um, adhere to all the um, so the safety, um, that, yeah, that it's a safe space for them to build. Once completed, the house must be registered with the NHBRC to ensure proper standards and guidelines are applied. All right, then we look at our contractual responsibilities. So the, like we said now, the contractual responsibilities, if you rent a place, is between the homeowner and the tenant. But if you build a house, it's between the builder and the owner. So number one, that you need to put down a breakdown of the costs. So you need to know exactly what you're paying for, and that could be quite extensive. Then you need detailed description of the materials and the finishes. It's very important that they tell you exactly what materials they use. And finishes, we look at things like what floors are they putting in, what tiles are they using, what countertops, what taps. Um, those are your finishes. And then you need to know the exact dimensions of the house, the dates and the methods of the payment. So what you will do is you will make, you won't pay anything up front. Um, you will do all the payments um, on, this, on the dates that has been stipulated in this contract. Then you need to know the completion date, more or less when it's going to be completed, because obviously you'll see now one of our disadvantages from building is that because of the weather, 
uh, they can't build, so that completion date is not always accurate. Then you need some guarantees provided by the builder. If the wall collapses, who's going to pay for that? And then a clause for cancellation. So anything can happen if um, you the builder just vanished. What happens? Or if something, the, the wall falls over, then the, you need to be a clause for cancellation. Or if you don't have the money um, and that cancellation comes from you, then that clause must be in there. All right. Again, like we said, our advantages and disadvantages. The only time that building is less or is cheaper is when you are an owner builder, if you build your own house. The owner can design the house to their own needs and likes so they can use the latest designs and the technologies. Um, you don't inherit also any old problems so you don't um, move into somebody else's broken pipes. Um, you can use the latest technologies. Um, the house can be completed according to your own schedule. If you will only accumulate the money over a year and you want that or the, the house to be built over a year, then that can be set out like that. If your funds run out, the building work can be stopped for a while. So you can you can stop and then only build on when you have money again. New houses are generally built in new areas and that will increase the resale value and it can be personally satisfying for the owner to be part of the building process so that you can see there was once nothing and now you have a house that's standing there. If we look at our disadvantages, it costs more than buying. Um, overseeing the process can be complicated and stressful because you're not sure what the end product will look like um, or that wall looks like this and you are not sure how it will look at the end. Then there's always a risk of faulty construction and design. It can take longer than anticipated due to delays, like I said, weather or the builder becomes sick and you can't, can't build anything like that. There may be added cost and additional work after construction, like you need landscaping and putting up a garden is very expensive. Then obviously you're also required to pay local municipal rates and taxes. Um, as well as for services. So even though you're not living in the house yet, or even though your house is not um, finished building yet, you will still pay rates and taxes. And then the planned house may not fit in with the local municipal regulations. So there's lots of rules and regulations when it comes to, to building. Um, and the municipality needs to give you approval. And at the end of the day, it might not fit into those regulations. All right, when we buy a house, there's two options when buying. We have our full title property or our sectional title. What does that mean? Full title, it's in the name. The title is your name. If you think about it, if I ask you what is your title, um, you will say Mrs. or Mr. Um, that is your title. That is your name. That is who you are. So full title, you own fully. It's on your name fully and this form of ownership is where the person who buys the property becomes the legal owner of the entire property so that is your typical residential house you own the house on the plot of land you own the swimming pool you own the driveway um, you own the gate you own everything that is on the property and it's either individually or couple owned so it's between you and your husband or you and your wife that you own the property but that's your full title property Sectional title property should please not be confused between renting. Um, I see a lot of the times when we mark at the end of the year, we see that people think that sectional title is renting. But as soon as you see that word title, remember that title is your name. So you own it, it's an ownership. And this is where the buyer becomes the legal owner of a section or a unit in a complex, and they share all the common areas, like the pool, the lift, the passages, the garden, the bryes, etc. Or it can be a unit in a housing complex or a block of flats. So you do not own the entire block of flats, you only own a section of the block of flats. You only own your house in the block of flats. You don't own the entire complex, you only own your house in the complex. All right, this is when we talk about buying in general, you buy a house in general. 
property can be bought cash or using a home loan. It's very seldom that people have um, that amount of cash to buy a, um, a house. Or you go to the bank and you get a home loan. They can talk in a paper. They can talk about home loans. They can talk about bonds. Or they can talk about mortgage. All the same thing. And that is something that can be obtained from a bank or other financial institution. But usually you will go to a bank and you will apply for a home loan. That home loan or bond or mortgage or money that is borrowed from the bank um, and then you pay it back in monthly installments over a fixed period of time, 20 to 30 years. So you can either, obviously, if you pay it off over 20 years, you're going to pay a lot more monthly, but you're going to pay less interest because you only pay interest over 20 years. But if you're going to take it over 30 years, your monthly payment will be lower but eventually you will pay more interest because you pay interest over 30 years. Then you will be required to pay a deposit, which is a down payment um, at the time of purchase. So a bank will, um, if you're a first time homeowner, the bank will give you that deposit and that will be part of your um, home loan that you can pay. Or if you're a second time homeowner, they will not necessarily give you that deposit because they will um, expect you to maybe sell your um, other house or you've accumulated enough money from your previous house to buy your next house. But obviously, because you're living in a house that doesn't belong to you, it's on credit, you have to pay interest. All right, once a consumer finds a suitable property, then they can put in a written offer to the owner of the property. We're going to look at that now. So we have an estate agent that will show you a house. You're very interested in the house. You will then pay a, or do an offer to purchase. All right. So you are not buying anything yet. You are just putting in an offer to purchase the house. And this document sets out all the conditions for your purchase. That is the price of the property and what is included. If the house is a million rand, then you will put in your offer to purchase. You want to pay 950 for the house. And once the seller accepts that offer to purchase, it then becomes a legal purchase agreement, which is referred to as the deed of sale or the contract of sale or an agreement of sale. So you have not, if you put in an offer to purchase, you haven't bought anything yet. You are just offering an amount to the seller to what you want to pay for the property. And that um, seller can get maybe three offer to purchases and then choose the one that suits his uh, needs the best or the highest offer or the cash offer. And then once he accepts the offer, it only becomes a legal purchase agreement. And that then becomes the deed of sale or the agreement of sale. But usually they talk about the deed of sale. So it's very important that you know, again, your definitions. And then, like we said, now home ownership can take different forms. It can either be full title or sectional title. All right. We have a few financial responsibilities when it comes to buying a house um, and contractual responsibilities. A buyer, again, like we said, a buyer will submit a written offer to purchase to the seller to indicate the amount that they're offering to pay. Once both the seller and the buyer signs the offer to purchase, it becomes a legal contract, which is the deed of sale. Um, and then this is a lawfully binding document that includes all the terms and conditions of the sale. Now we look at what is in this deed of sale or this contract or this agreement of sales. We want our correct names and address of the seller and the buyer. We want the address and a clear description and purchasing price, a stipulation that the transaction is subject to a bond being obtained within a set period. So in other words, if you still need a proof, so you've put an offer to purchase, uh, it's turning to a deed of sale, but there will be a clause in there that says that this house or this um, will only go through if you get bond approval from the bank because that obviously takes some, some time as well. 
then your date of occupation. In other words, what date will you be able to move in and on what date does that house goes on to your name? A stipulation that the seller is responsible for the state agent's commission. So the seller pays for the state agent's commission and then a beetle and electrical certificate. So that is what the seller is responsible for. And the buyer is responsible for all other expenses. Occupational rent is payable by the buyer if the transfer is not done by the date of occupation. So if you are supposed to move in on the 1st of October, but things got delayed and you are only allowed to move in the 10th of October, then whoever lives in the house will have to pay occupational rent. So that is rent that is payable when the house is not fully on your name yet. A list of repairs to be done prior to transfer. So if there is a broken pool or something is leaking or something doesn't work, then all of that lists or uh, all of those repairs must be on a list before the transfer can happen. A list of items to be removed and of those to remain. Like if you move into a house and you walk into the house and you see this beautiful chandelier hanging and you go, wow, I want to buy this house because of this beautiful chandelier. Then the, uh, it should be in the contract that the seller is going to remove that chandelier. Then that needs to be on the um, contract on this deed of sale. And then a clause that stipulates the penalties if one of the parties be guilty of the breach of contract. So if somebody breaks the contract, then there will be a penalty fee that you will have to pay. Because as soon as you sign that, you must buy the house. All right. Again, we get to our advantages and disadvantages of this full title property. All right, if you look at the advantages, you are the buyer. Remember, full title, again, it's on your name. You own the property. You become the legal owner of the property, and you have some sort of security to your house. Nobody can put you out of the house unless you can't pay. The owner can make changes to the property. It's your property. Property. Obviously, we need to have, um, you need to get approval from the municipality, but if you want to build on or you want to build up or you want to plant a tree or you want to break down something, then you can because you own the property. The property can be used as a security for a bank loan. So remember in uh, our, the tenant, you have no security for a bank loan. So now if you want to start a business, uh, then you can put your house as collateral for for that business. So in other words, if your business fails, then they can take money from your bond that you've already paid. This is a good investment because the value of the property increases over time. As the interest rate goes up and as time goes on, the, the house is of more value. So eventually you make a profit when you sell the house. It can also be used to run a business from, or you can rent it out and you can make um, a profit. A lot of the time, what they do now is they, uh, they have a flatlet or they turn the garage into a flatlet and they make it pretty and they rent it out um, or they uh, put it on a website and then you can um, rent it out. Um, you can leave it in your will for your family, so you can leave it for your children. Disadvantage, obviously we've now established that it's more expensive to buy than to rent, so initially it will be more more expensive, but then in the long run, you're paying for your own asset. The owner is responsible for insurance, and you as the owner, that's a disadvantage because you need to buy insurance. You need to make sure that it's safe and secure, so you need to put on burglar bars, a gate. You, you must pay for all the repairs and maintenance, and the geezer burst, it's on you. Or if something breaks, then you have to pay for it. You must also pay rates and taxes to the municipality. It could be a bad bad investment if the area deteriorates and you don't make a good profit. It could be difficult to sell the property if you need to move um, unexpectedly. Um, it obviously takes some time to sell. If the property is sold, capital gains tax must be paid on the profit of the sale. Now, if we go back to the consumer, you've learned about capital gains tax. As soon as you sell something and you make a profit and you gain capital, you have to pay tax.
taxed on that. So you will pay tax on the profit that you make on the sale of the property. And then structural changes can be made to the exterior, but again, you need approval to the municipality. Right, here again is your, uh, uh, your terms that you need to know, your full title property. You remember you own the entire property, the structure of the plot of land. Um, there's your types of insurances, your two types of insurances that you have to pay, your bond protection. It ensures that if you die, then your bond will be paid off. And then here at the bottom, we have our homeowner's insurance. Remember, that's the one that doesn't say in the name. So therefore, we not, must remember that that's the structure of the house. Then our deed of sale. Remember, the offer to purchase becomes the deed of sale. And then your mortgage bond is the bond that you will get from the bank, your home loan. All right, let's look at a few questions. So, as you know, um, in, in the short questions, we have, um, we have from all the different sections um, in the short questions. So it can either be a um, multiple choice question where you need to select A, B, or D. Uh, you will, or like on or like 1.5, select three advantages, or it will be a match of description of payment in column B with the payment in column A. So you match column A and B together. So let's quickly look at the answers there. All right, 1.4.1, we will get to levies now when we do our sectional title but our levies is paid to the body corporate. Then 1.4.2, our bond repayment. Remember, that is the payment that you pay. That's A, the monthly repayment to the bank for your home loan. 1.4.3, the rates and taxes. Remember, that's the rates and taxes, the property rates and taxes that you pay to the municipality. So that will be H, it's paid to the local municipality. Deposit, remember, that's something that you pay before you can move in. So it's number C, it's paid when signing a lease agreement. And then rent is something that you pay monthly for the use of the property, which the answer is G there. All right, then if we go there to 1.5, select three advantages of renting a home. You can leave the home to your family one day. We know we can't leave the home to our family one day because you don't own it. But we know we can run a business from the home with permission. So B is correct. The property can be a security for a home loan. We know that that's not right because you don't own the house. It's cheaper in the long term. It's not necessarily cheaper in the long term because your um, rent goes up. And remember, eventually you're paying towards somebody else's bond. So therefore, E is also correct. You're not responsible for maintenance if you rent a house because the owner pays for the maintenance. And then if there are fewer monthly expenses, we know that that's correct because we know that the owner pays those insurances, they need to pay property rates and taxes, they need to pay for maintenance, where you just pay your bond, uh, you just pay your, your, um, your rent, um, and then you just um, do the upkeep of your house. And then 1.1.14, the document that proves that you are the owner of the property. So remember, you own the property. Okay, we look at D. So the deed of sale is when the um, when it becomes your home. But remember, you don't own it yet. You only own it when you get the title deed, and that is when you've made the final payment um, of your um, of your last installment. Sectional title B, we know that that is not correct. And then your mortgage bond is obviously the bond that you pay to the bank. So it can only be D. So remember, when you get a multiple choice question like this, there's one that's completely incorrect, and then one that's right, and then another two that will confuse you. So you need to play the game of elimination when it comes to this. And then very important, we also see this at the end of the year, is that people leave short questions out. You have a quarter chance of being right. So rather fill in something than nothing, please. Then 1.15, a contract between a credit provider 
and the buyer of the property is our mortgage bond. The credit provider is the bank and you own the property. We know that the deed of sale is between the seller and the buyer, not the credit provider. Collateral bond is incorrect and subsidy is incorrect. So it can only be the mortgage bond protection or the mortgage bond. Right, and here we get to our sectional title. And this lovely picture at the bottom to explain to us there. Looks like Burgundy Estate. So we have, there you can see, we have a security gate that we will um, go into. You can see a garden there in the middle, and then you see separate houses in this estate. So you don't own the entire estate. You only own a section of the estate. The, this ownership, the buyer becomes the legal owner of a section or a unit in a complex. So you only own this house here in front on the right-hand side. You don't own the entire complex. And then you all share the common area. So if there's a pool there in the middle, then everybody can use the pool. And there's a park, everybody is allowed to use the park. And you all own a section of the braai areas or the passages or the gardens or the roads or the security. And that could also be, if you looked at the top, it can be units in a housing complex or a block of flats. So you don't own the entire block of flats, you only own your flat in the block of flats. All right, what is important that we need to know when it comes to our sectional title? All owners becomes part of the body corporate. So the body corporate is the body that controls, manages, and administers the complex or the block of flats. So if, if you are a homeowner, you automatically become part of the body corporate. They will have meetings and they will elect trustees that will be responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the complex or the block of flats. So you have somebody that is the treasurer that is in charge of all the money, you have a secretary, you have a chairman, you have somebody that's in charge of the security and somebody that's in charge of maintenance. The unit or the members or the owners are required to pay levies to the body corporate. So because you live in that block of flats or because you live in that complex, you will pay levies to the body corporate. And what does those levies cover? The rates and taxes, and this is very important when you come to when it comes to levies, is that it is not for you. It is for the rates and taxes of the common areas. It is for the insurance of the common areas. It's for the repair and maintenance of the common areas. The wages and salaries of staff and the water electricity used for the common areas. We get it every time where it says, what is levies used for? And then the learners write, it's for electricity or it's for water. And then we have to mark it incorrect because um, it, it's incorrect because is it your water electricity for your unit or for your um, flat or for your house in? No, it is for the common area. So it's very important that you write that it's for the common areas. So that is to put, um, to use water for the garden in the common areas um, or to give water to the park or for the electricity that they use for the gates um, or for the street lights or for anything that is used in the common area. So all those levies. And there's lots of things that will determine those, those levies. If there's 600 houses in the complex, your levies will be a lot less. If there is, um, and we'll get to that a little bit later as well, that if you have a lot of extra perks, you have a, a gym or you have a pool, um, then your levies will go up um, because there's more things that need to be maintained. But if it's just a block of flats, with parking at the bottom and there's no gate, then obviously the levies will be a lot lower because there's not a lot to pay for. So like we said, it's for the rates and taxes and the insurance of the common areas. The repair and maintenance, if the gate breaks, then they will use the levies to repair the gate. 
and they'll use from everybody's money because everybody uses the gate and everybody only everybody needs to go through the gate. Um, wages and salaries of the staff. So that could be the staff that maintains the gardens or the um, the man that uh, the security guard that stands by the gate. Um, or it could be somebody that is in charge of maintenance or somebody that paints the, the exterior of the house. Right, and again, we have our advantages and disadvantages. All right, remember sectional title. Again, title, you own it. It's on your name. So do not get confused between renting and sectional title. Okay, so look at the advantages. The buyer becomes the legal owner of the property. Again, just like full title, you own a property. And you can, if, the, um, if it allows you, you're allowed to do anything. It will provide you greater security in living in a freestanding property. So that is another advantage. Um, they, you have security. You have lots of people that stay in the complex. Um, you'll have less maintenance because you don't have to maintain the road or maintain the common areas. Again, your property can be used as security for a bank loan because you own it. It's also a good investment because, again, the value of the property will increase and you can sell it for a profit. You have fewer responsibilities because the body corporate will control and manage the common areas. So they are responsible for the, the gardens and the pool and the security. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, and then you can enjoy the use of the common facilities and you do not have to maintain them. Um, so somebody else will maintain the pool and somebody else will look after the gate. And then again, you can leave it in your wall for your family because you own it. Then if we look at the disadvantages, the owner must abide to the rules of the body corporate. So usually when it, when we come into a complex, um, we there's lots of rules and regulations. Um, you're only allowed to have a specific building style. You're only allowed to um, paint your house a certain color. You're not allowed to change the front exterior of the house or you're only allowed to use this um, architect, um, et cetera. Then you need permission from the body corporate and the municipality for changes. You have to pay a levy to cover the cost. So again, that's an additional cost. Levies increases annually because as the inflation rate increases, it will increase the levies as well. Then it's not as private as full title properties because you have to share all the amenities, so you can't go on a relaxing, um, think you're going to swim alone, um, because everybody can use the pool and everybody can use um, the uh, the garden or the park um, or the recreational areas. Um, and then obviously you live in close proximity. If you live in a flat, you can hear everything. Again, if the property is sold, you need to pay capital gains tax, and it also might be done difficult to sell if you have to move unexpectedly. All right, again, we have our terms that we need to know, the body corporate, sectional title, etc. All right, here we have an exam practice. All right, so when we look at our longer questions, remember we said this is question five, only 20 marks is where you score marks um, and you will get an advertisement or a case study or um, an information piece. Now, very important, they will never put unuseful information in a case study. They want you to use everything in that case study. So when we get to 5.3, it says name and explain the type of owner ownership in the advertisement, home ownership. So we know when we get to home ownership, there's two types of home ownership. Is it sectional title or is it full title? Those are the two types of home ownership. So you need to name it and then you need to explain it. So now, how do I know? So when I look at the case study, 
Um, I see it's a waterfall, how in South Africa, I need to buy now. Before the price increase, I get 10% discount, free levies. So there is our first piece of information that tells us what type of home ownership it is. And because we don't pay levies when it's full title, it can only be sectional title. I pay free bond costs, so I might not pay bond costs. They talk about top education for schools, entertainment, luxury apartment. So we know that that's an apartment. So because it's an apartment, um, and then they tell me what other amenities is included. So I know that it's sectional title. So I will first name it, and I will say it's sectional title. And then it will tell me to explain it, explain sectional title. The owner becomes the legal um, owner of a section of the housing complex, and I need to share the um, common amenities. Or I become the legal owner of a unit or a section of a building, and I share the common properties. So that is your sectional title, but I first need to name it and explain it. What I also tell my learners is that we um, go in with a highlighter when you go in to write your, your paper and highlight the verb. What do they want? They need to, I need to name and I need to explain it. I also want you to please read the question twice and look at the mark allocation because the mark allocation will tell you how much I must write or what I must write. Um, so I need to name it and then explain it. Then 5.3.2, identify. So identify means that I can literally pinpoint to the answer in the advertisement. Identify in the advertisement above three services. Now I just quickly want to stop there. If in a question they give you how many to write, so they say, name three, list two, explain six, um, advise four. If they give a number in the question, we are only allowed to mark the first three in this case now. So you can write a hundred things, but we will only mark the first three. But if they don't say Anything in the case study. If I just said identify in the advertisement um, services that will be paid for by the levies, then you could have written everything and we need to look out of all the information that you write for the correct three. But because in this case it says the first or it says three services, I can only mark the first three. Identify three services that will be paid for by the levies and there they tell you what does that levies include those are the amenities so it has a swimming pool it has um, outstanding security it has a gym it has fiber and dstv ready it has a wellness spa game rooms and children play areas and a cinnamon room um, so all of that is what you could have written so there's lots of information that you could have written there All right, the next question says to describe. Okay, so when I describe, I need to give lots of information why it will be financially beneficial to buy property in the development above. So I need to look at finances. It needs to be all, um, it has to be, um, you need to write about money, finances to buy property in this development. How much was I write? I must at least write six um, things in order to get my, my, my marks. Describe why it will be beneficial. So if you look in your case study, if we go back there, we see that um, it's luxury apartments and you don't, you pay free bond costs. So if you look there, if we go back there, it will be financially beneficial, free bond cost. And the levies is free for a year. It all time that in the case study and there's a 10 percent discount um so you all of that already three marks just from writing it out of the case study the buyer doesn't have to maintain the common properties because the body corporate that is a financial beneficial because i don't have to pay for it i don't have to maintain the pool because the body corporate pays for it 
It is set and it's free for a year. It is safe. It has outstanding security. So I don't have to pay for extra security. I don't have to put up a gate. I don't have to pay for an alarm or a burglar bars because it has excellent security. So that is covered by your levies. All the amenities are on site. You've got a restaurant, you've got a gym, a game room. So you will save on entertaining because you can just send your children to the play area or to the cinema room. Cinema room. Um, and then it's close to a shopping mall and top education. So I will save on transport costs because I don't have to travel very far. All right, let's quickly look at a few more um, questions here. State who manages sectional title properties. Just for one mark, and I know that that is our, if you look at your answers here, that is your body corporate. They manage the sectional title properties. Then we've got, now again, if you know your definitions, you wouldn't be able to answer the first three questions. Um, 5.2 says to explain the term lease. It is the contract, remember it's the contract or the legal agreement between the property owner and the tenant. Name two types of insurances that homeowners should have. Now, sorry, just to quickly go back, remember I need to give two facts in order to get the, that two marks. So remember, one mark per fact. 5.3. Name two. So because it says it, it's got the, the number in the question, I can only mark the first two. So don't write a paragraph if it says name two because I'm only allowed to mark the first two. Name two types of insurances that the homeowner should have. And that could have been any of those three. Homeowner's comprehensive insurance. Remember, that's for the structure of the house. The one that doesn't tell you what it is. The household content insurance is for everything that is in the house. Um, if some, if the, if there's a theft or if your husband's down, it will cover for the TV and the furniture. And then we have our life insurance or our mortgage bond protection insurance. And remember that covers. If you pass away, it will cover the bond. It will pay for the outstanding amount. Then 5.4, it says, explain the financial disadvantages of building a house. So I'm going to read that again. Explain. So how much must I explain? I must at least give three facts. Explain the financial. So I need to talk about money. And it needs to be the disadvantages. Remember I said you need to know all your advantages and disadvantages of building a house. But now I can't just write, and this is what we also see. People read and they read about, oh, okay, quickly, I need to know the disadvantages of building a house. And then they write it from their notes, the disadvantages of building a house. But yeah, they're specifically talking about the financial disadvantages. And this is why it's so difficult to get an A in, um, in consumers at the end of the year because of silly mistakes that we make of this. They want to, um, you want to learn your work and just write it exactly from your notes. But you need to be able to adapt. You need to be able to apply knowledge. So I need to explain the financial disadvantages of building a house. I'm building a house. We know that there could be delays. So it could lead to additional building costs. Unexpected costs, like um, such as the preparation of a site. They need to dig a little bit deeper because the ground is very hard. And they need to get a digger loader in order to do that. So we're going to pay extra for that like also additional added costs after construction, like landscaping, when you need to start a garden, and we've established that starting a garden is very um, expensive. Then we also look at paying municipal rates and taxes before occupation. So um, you need to, before you can occupy, you still need to pay rates and taxes. So you could have stayed there, uh, or your house takes a year to build, you must still pay rates and taxes. It can cost more than buying a house um, because of all the extra costs of building materials and lands and finishes. 
There's always a risk of faulty construction and design, and that could cost more money. Can you see how I'm linking it to money again? And then the builder or homeowner can run out of money and may not be able to complete the house. And then an incomplete house will have no value. All right, and there we have our, um, our answers there. Um, the next one there said, um, state the financial information that must be included in the sales agreement when buying a full title property. Again, I need to write three facts. State the financial information. Again, I need to apply my knowledge because I need to take out financial information that must be included in the sales agreement when buying a full title property. So this is where I take my highlighter and I highlight what is my verb. What do they want? I need to talk about full title, so I can't make any mention of sectional title. So I need the correct purchasing price. It must um, record any um, like any granting of bonds. So if you have to still get a bond approval, then that must be in there. Occupational interest. Remember, if you stay longer in the house and it's not done on the date of occupation, you're going to pay occupational rent. A stipulation that the seller is responsible for the estate agent's commission. Again, we're talking about money. The seller pay for the estate agent because the seller is the one who got the estate agent to sell the house for him. So therefore, they need to pay for it. The seller is responsible for the electrical clearance certificate. Um, and if there's any termites, um, then they will pay for that as well to get that um, fumigated. Um, a stipulation that the buyer is responsible for all other expenses, like if there needs to be repainting or you need to fix something, then the buyer um, is responsible for that. Um, a clause that stipulates penalties if there's a break in contract or a breach in contract, and it in usually includes a foot stewards, recognized English word there, and meaning as is clause. So you will buy it as is. If there's any hidden cost, that must be stated. All right, we continue with our questions. Name two responsibilities of each of the following in terms of a housing complex. So here we're talking about a housing complex. What responsibilities does the tenant have? So again, I am living in a state or I'm living in a complex. Um, or I'm living in a block of flats, but I live in my flat, I'm renting, I don't own anything. What am I going to pay? Let's look at the answers here. I will pay electricity for my own unit. Remember, I can't just write electricity. What electricity is that for? It's for my own unit. I'm not, remember, the tenant doesn't pay levies. Who pays levies? The owner of the property. So if you rent the, the flat or you rent in the, um, in the estate, you will not pay levies because the levies is paid by the owner. You will take care of the inside of the unit. So you'll make sure that the inside of the unit is clean. You will pay a deposit before moving in. You will pay rent on time and you will abide by the rules um, and regulations of the complex. Those are the responsibilities of the tenant. Then if we look at the body corporate, what are the responsibilities of the body corporate when in the housing complex? They are responsible for the election of the trustees. They will control or administer or manage the block of flats. So they are there to run the complex, basically. They will pay the rates and the taxes to this municipality for the complex. Remember, they're not going to pay your rates and taxes. They're going to pay the rates and taxes for the complex. They will pay insurance for the complex. And again, can you see, I can't just say they pay water electricity. No, for what? For the common areas. They will repair and maintain the common areas. They will take care of waste disposal and they will provide security for the complex. You are still responsible for your own security. So if you feel unsafe in the complex, you are still required to pay for your own safety and security. Then what are the two responsibilities of the landlord or the lesser? They will draw up a lease agreement. They will uh, 
maintain the interior part of the unit. Remember the maintenance if the geyser breaks. They will pay a monthly levy to the body corporate and they will pay rates and taxes if it is not included in the levies. So that will also determine, um, it all depends on what the levies includes. All right, let's look at the benefits of building a new home. Um, we've already, this is the advantages of building a new home. This is why I said, can you see, you need to know your advantages and disadvantages. It can cost less if you're the owner builder. You cannot just say it can cost less because that's incorrect. It's only less if the owner is the builder. Um, the house can be designed to your own specifications. You can use the latest designs and technologies. An envir environmentally friendly house can be created. So you can use, um, you can build your house north facing and you can put up a um, solar system, etc. You can um, finish it on your own schedule. Um, you can halt it if there's no funds. Um, it's an investment. Um, there's no inheritance of old problems because it's a brand new house. You can design your own garden. New houses are built in growing or new developments, so we know that the resale value of the house is more. Any six where I've discussed the benefits of building a new home. Then we go back to name NAS's type of owner ownership. So if I go back to my um, my scenario, there they talk about NAS as a young graduate um, used a home loan to buy a three-bedroom house. So a three-bedroom house. She paid a 10% deposit. She renovated the interior to suit the modern test. She installed an alarm system. She built high walls around the house to have an enclosed space. It's close to a good school and a shopping mall. Um, she got retrenched from work and she quickly found a family of two children to rent her property and received a good rental income. So important, nowhere do they talk about levies or nowhere do they talk about in a complex or in a flat. So I know I live in a three bedroom house and they don't talk about complex. So therefore I know it is a full title. Let's just quickly go back there, full title. Describe the type of home ownership. So I'm not just, I um, shouldn't only know the, the name of it. I must also be able to describe it because in the previous question, I described sectional title. So the owner or NAS became the legal owner of the entire property and the land and all the structures on it for two marks. Then explain the term deposit. Remember, the deposit is something, it's a down payment or it's an, an initial payment or it's something that you pay towards the purchase of the home or you give it in advance and it's part of the purchase or it's towards the purchase. Because although, remember, if you pay a deposit, it's going to be subtracted from your installments. So the bigger your deposit, the smaller your installments. All right, 5.3.4 says, state the precautionary measures that NAS took with regards to safety. So again, they will not put unnecessary information in the case study. You need to be able to use the case study to get the answer. What did she do? She installed an alarm system and she built a wall in the case study. In terms of NAS's house, name and explain the following. Two types of insurances that NAS should have. So she must have, remember, we said that household content, because if you look at B, it says one type of insurance the tenant, the tenant should have, the tenant should have, but NAS is the owner. So she must have the mortgage bond protection that settles the home loan if something happens to her, and she must have homeowner's comprehensive insurance. So if there's a natural disaster or an accident or a fire and your house burns down, then that insurance will pay out. And then the type of insurance the tenant should have, the tenant should have, is the household content insurance. Then five points, oh, and then you need to, obviously, because it's two marks, I need to explain it. That they didn't tell you to explain. Well, they said at the top, sorry, name and explain. So household content, I'm naming it and I'm explaining it. 
5.3.6 suggests four reasons why Naz was able to rent out her property so quickly. So again, all the information is in the case study. Don't make up your own things. The three bedroom was suitable for a family with children. So it's not a one bedroom. It was a three bedroom. She renovated the interior. She, has, she made it more attractive and modern. She has a good security or high walls and an alarm system. So people are um, safe and secure when they live in there. Um, it's close to schools, so it's convenient for this family with children. It's close to shopping malls, so they don't have to pay a lot for a Uber or they don't have to pay a lot of transfer, um, transport costs. And there was a demand for rentals in the area, so she rented it out quickly. Um, welcome back. Uh, we're quickly going to have a look at the answers of the multiple choice questions, the housing quiz that you got. Just going to give you a few more seconds just for everybody to come back online. All right, let's quickly look at the answers. So a sectional title property includes what? So what did we say, a sectional title? Um, you only own a part of the complex. So if we look, it says there, a structure and surrounding land, we know that is full title. The entire plot with a single property, still full title. So we know the answer is C, it's a unit in an apartment building. So that was the correct answer there. C, a unit in an apartment building. Then question two said the contract for a builder should include the following. So this is about the builder. So we have the date of completion, occupational rent is paid for a buyer and a seller. We know it's on transfer duty. We know it's on municipal rate. So it can only be the date of completion should be in the contract for a builder. So the answer there is 2A. Then number three, an offer to purchase once it is accepted by the seller. Um, and from our previous information, we've learned that an offer to purchase becomes the deed of sale. The deed of transfer is incorrect. The title deed is only once you get, once you've paid the final um, installment sale. A mortgage agreement is between you and the bank, so it is deed of sale. So it's D, 3D. Then question four, levies are used for the following, household insurance. We know that levies got nothing to do with um, your house. Then we have insurances on the buildings. So that could be um, any building. So the answer is B. Um, it cannot be C because it says owner's electricity consumption, and we know the levies is not for anything in the flat or in the house of the um, owner. And it also bond protection insurance covers your bond if you can't pay anymore, so it can only be B. So again, we're playing the game of elimination. So therefore, it's for B. Then if we look at five, the homeowner will pay the following monthly. So this is where it could be a little bit confusing. The homeowner, you own the house, you pay. The answer there is A, bond and municipal services. It can't be rent and levies because you don't pay rent if you're a homeowner. Building inspection and service connection fee, we know that that is if you build a house. And transfer fees is money that is paid um, once you move into the house or it's fees to get um, your from your name onto um, or from the seller's name onto the buyer's name, and that is not something that you pay monthly. So therefore, it can only be 5A. Then if you look at question six, it says the financial advantages of buying a full title. Yes, it gives people a sense of security, but that's not financial. You can sell it and make a profit. The answer there was B. Uh, C is also correct. You can leave it for your family, but it's not financial advantage. And again, more privacy than a sectional title property. We also know that that is correct, but it's not financial, and therefore it can only be B. Question seven, a tenant is responsible for the following. 
the maintenance of the property. Um, the tenant is not responsible for the maintenance, the homeowner is. The homeowner's insurance is also only paid by the homeowner, but a tenant can take out household insurance, so therefore it is C. And remember that tenant does not pay property rates, so therefore it cannot be D. So it is 7C. Question 8. A legal agreement between a landlord and a tenant. Remember the deed of sales between the owner and buyer. Building contract is between the builder and the buyer. So therefore it is C, a lease agreement. And then agreement of sale. Could not be correct because it's not between the landlord and the tenant. So you sign a lease agreement. So it's 8C. Then number nine, a group of people who manages a sectional title complex. We know it's the body corporate. So it's B, 9B. And then question 10, the advantages of renting. Monthly rent is not influenced by the change in the interest rate. We know that that is correct because it cannot be B, rent usually increases annually, that's a disadvantage. No guarantee that the lease will be renewed is another disadvantage, and it's not an investment, so therefore it's also a disadvantage, so therefore it can only be A. So there we have our answers for the housing quiz. Thank you for completing that. All right, let's continue with our next set of notes. So now we are going to look at the, um, the appliances, the housing appliances. So again, I don't know where to start. I start with my exam guidelines. What do I need to know? I need to know the factors to consider when shopping for household appliances. I need to know the choice of household appliances. There I need to know those are the different household appliances. You will see in your book there are a few more household appliances and therefore we don't study from our textbook because then you're going to study everything and it might not be in the exam guidelines. So please, we sit with the exam guidelines and we follow those exam guidelines. And then we need to know the financial and contractual responsibilities. Um, and the rights and responsibilities of the consumer and the seller. All right, um, and again, you need to know your verbs. What does it mean to discuss, describe, explain, justify? And then there we've got our higher cognitive questions. And in each section, there are a few higher cognitive questions and they will start with things like analyze, evaluate or use your critical analysis or create something. Right. Again, there in our housing and interior, what do I need to know? I need to explain and discuss the factors to consider. We're going to look at that now. We need to compare and evaluate different appliances. We need to explain the financial and contractual responsibilities, calculate the cost of the installment sale transaction, and identify and explain the rights of the consumer and the seller. And all of this can be asked in a statement or a case study or a scenario or a cartoon or a picture. Right, and there is your housing appliances that you need to know. Your washing machine, fridge, heat freezer, stove, and microwave. Right, again, before we buy something, you're not gonna close your eyes and use a pen to determine which one and out of macro you are going to buy, you will first consider the factors when purchasing appliances. So before you buy something, you will first look at your family needs. So the first bullet there says you need to match your machine's capacity to your family size. So in other words, if you have a big family, we're going to look at that top loader that can fit a lot of clothes in. Um, uh, the next one that we will look at is we will, we will look at um, desirable features. So we look at something you, you want to buy a machine, uh, whether it's a washing machine or a fridge um, that uses a low electricity consumption or a low water consumption or a low watts consumption. Um, or you need something that self cleans or something like a fridge that automatically defrosts. So those are the desirable features that you will look at when you buy an appliance. And then you will ensure that the appliance fits the available space. 
Lots of flats that you move in only has a space under a counter for a washing machine. And then later on, when we see when we do washing machines, you're going to have to buy a front loader because a top loader won't fit in there. So um, the block of flats has been made for specifically to buy a front loader. Then the second one that you will look at is your budget. Very important. That's the first thing we usually look at is your budget. How much money do I have available? So I will choose a price that fits my finances. Um, then I will compare options through research. So I will search different brands, different shops. I'll look at macro, I'll look at game. And then I'll look, also look at different sizes. And then I will check my warranty um, and my terms and duration. Um, and also be careful, like for instance, my microwave says it says big on the front cover that it got a 10 year warranty. But then in the small print, it says on the inside cavity of the microwave. So those are the terms and conditions that you have to look at. And then obviously you wanna buy the best um, affordable quality that you can buy. And then we want to make our life easier. So we're going to look at the ease of the use. Does it reduce your workload? So later on, when we look at our washing machines, we will look at a front loader or a top loader, and we will look at a twin tub. And we will see that the twin tub uses a lot more energy because you physically need to transfer the clothes from the washer to the spinner. So that will not necessarily reduce your workload, but it will be cheaper. We also look at simple operation with clear instructions. Um, so we will look at something that will, you know, is it easy to understand, easy to operate? And then the safe design with clear safety warnings. So especially for if you have little children, then you want that design that can lock it so that they can't open the dishwasher or the washing machine. All right. Um, our next one is the choice of appliance. So we're going to look at a few different criteria. And when we look at energy consumption, there are two different things that um, is underneath energy consumption. You have human energy. So that is exactly what it says. It is the energy that you as a human use. And then on the other side, we have non-human energy. We're going to look at electricity and water. So when we look at our human energy consumption, we look at um, we need something that saves us time and effort because um, it should make our life easier. Uh, we're going to look at something that is user-friendly and convenient, so easy to use and convenient to use and shouldn't be so much um, hassle to clean or to maintain or to operate. Then we look at adjustable for different users. So can any user, whether you're in a wheelchair um, or whether you're short or tall or uh, whoever can use it, then we look at the safety orientated, like is it safe to use? Um, is it easy to maintain? And then there must be clear instructions. So those will all find, fall under human energy needs. Then if they talk about non-human energy needs, we're going to look at electricity and water. So number one, you will opt for that energy efficient appliance. You will select a model with eco-friendly cycles. And when you choose an appliance, on the appliance, they will have that little house with a different color tabs there, A marked A to G. They will have that on the appliance. And if you buy something that's got an A or um, the latest one says A++++ or an A++ or an A+, or an A, that's got a good energy um, usage. So in other words, it uses um, the least amount of, of electricity. And then the more you go down to G, uh, the poorer electricity, so you, um, then you will use a lot more energy. Um, so obviously we know that initially, if you buy something with an A++ rating, it will be, um, uh, well, it will be less, it will be eventually, or initially, it will be more expensive, but in the long run, you will um, save a lot of money. Where if you buy something that goes more towards the EFG, initially it will be uh, cheaper. So it will be a cheaper um, buy for you initially. But in the long run, you're going to use a lot more electricity. So therefore, it will work out a lot more um, for you. Then if we look at our water, 
You will choose an appliance with efficient water consumption and eco cycles. So that is our dishwasher or our washing machine. Um, then you need to look at the benefits of reduced water usage. So you're going to look for something that's got a low energy and utility cost. So the less water, the, if it uses a, a lot less water, you're going to pay less on your water bill. Therefore, it will also put less strain on the water resources, and it will also reduce the pressure, pressure on the sewage system because less water um, will go through the sewage system. Right. Then we look at the functionality and the environmental impact. So if we look at the functionality, um, the first thing that you will look at there is your key features. Um, for instance, um, a dishwasher. Does a dishwasher wash and dry? Because there's no point for it just to be washed, but then you must still dry it. Um, and then also we can look at the efficiency. How well does it dry? Same with a washing machine. Um, there's no point in buying a washing machine. And the key feature is obviously to wash it and to spin it so that it's relatively dry so that when you hang it up, the water is not dripping out. Um, but you also want it to, be, to do that efficiently. Then we also need to look at the re re reliability of it. Is it reliable? Is it user friendly? Can I um, use it easily? Um, we're going to look at the capacity, how much it can take, how much washing it can take, and then the ease of maintenance. Is it difficult or is it easy to maintain or difficult to maintain? And then because we are going green, um, we're going to look at the environmental impact. So you will consider your life cycle impact during the production of it, during the use of it, and the disposal of it. And then you will choose that eco-friendly appliance that use low water and low electricity. And remember, initially, you will pay more for it, but in the long run, it will work out cheaper. And then we're also looking at utilize energy rating labels for, to make an informed decision. So you will look at that label from A to G and make your decision from that. And, and then we will reduce pollution through e-waste recycling. So all your electronical waste, what are you going to do with it? Um, they've got big depots um, in front of big shops like Macro. They've got a big container where you can throw all your e-waste and then they will recycle it and use the parts again so that they don't have to make it up from scratch. All right. So you need information about all your appliances in order to answer the questions. So when, and these are the four types of washing machines that they can ask you. We have our top loader, front loader, and our washer dryer combination, and our twin tub. So if you look at the capacity, we can see that the top loader can fit a lot more clothes in. So therefore, um, if you look at your big family, if in the scenario they talk about there's a big family, then you will choose the top loader because I can fit a lot of clothes in there. You can see the front loader can not fit in as much clothes, more or less the same as the washer dryer. And then the twin type can also not fit in a lot of clothes. But if we look at the rest of them, you'll see that those are the cheapest option. So placement, you cannot put a top loader under a counter where the front loader can go under the counter, the wash and dry is flexible, you can put it under a counter or not. And then the twin tub is usually big, big and bulky, so it will use up a lot of space. Then if you look at the water usage, it, the, the top loader uses a lot of water because if you put your, your clothes in there, the water must cover all your clothes in order to wash it. So you will choose the, set, the, the setting on your um, washing machine, um, to, depending on the amount of clothes that you are washing. The front loader uses less water because you, um, you will put your clothes in and the, the clothes will spin around. So therefore it will be submerged in the water the whole time. So it doesn't need to cover all the clothes. And then the water usage for the wash and dryer also varies um, depending on the amount that you put in. And then the water usage you can manually control the twin types water usage because again it depends on the amount of water that you or the amount of washing that you do. Then if we look at the cycle time, you you usually have a quick wash on the top loader, so you can wash that quickly. The front loader does take longer, 
The wash to dry will obviously take the longest because it's exactly what it says. It will first wash. So a washer dryer is basically a washing machine and a tumble dryer in one. So it will first wash the clothes and then it will dry the clothes so that it's completely dry and that you can fold it up and pack it away. Where all the others, you must first hang up the clothes. And then your cycle time with your twin tub will also you'll be able to manually control that. If we look at the non-human energy use, um, remember non-human is electricity. So um, top loader uses a, a lot of electricity because you can um, wash a lot of clothes. Um, the front loader uses the least amount of electricity. Um, and then the washer dryer is obviously very high because it uses a lot of electricity because it's got a, um, a thermal drum that will um, heat it up and it will dry the clothes as well. And then the twin top also uses, doesn't use that much electricity. Then um, if you look at the top loader, it needs hot water. So you need to connect the top loader to your geyser if you want to use hot water to wash. Where the front loader you, has got an internal drum. So it will heat up if you use the warm setting. Um, it's got a drum that will heat up. The washer dryer, um, it's space saving, but it's not fully, it can also not fully dry sometimes, and then you have to hang it up anyway, or you have to put it in for longer. And then the thing about a twin tub is that you need to manually transfer the clothes. So if you look on the left hand side, there is your washing drum that you will wash the clothes, then you need to put it into the spinner on the right hand side. So you have to wait for it to be done washing. So that is something that you need to manually do. So you can't go to the shops um, and just come back and hang up your clothes. Um, a top loader usually has a moderate cost. A uh, front loader costs more than a top loader. Then we've got the washer dryer combination. And obviously that's the most expensive one, but you will save on having to buy a separate dryer. And then the twin tub, because it's got manually uh, manual transfer, it will be the cheaper option. So you need to know this information in order to answer the question um, if you get a scenario. All right, so let's look at a few key points when it comes to our washing machine. We have our human energy, in other words, you actually physically using it. Um, Appropriate capacity for the family size. So again, if you've got a small family, you can buy a smaller washing machine, big family, big washing machine. It must be easy to use controls and it should be have an accessible lint filter so that you can clean your washing machine. Non-human energy, remember non-human is our electricity, um, adjustable temperature settings. So obviously if you want a cold wash, then you're not going to use as much electricity or automatic cold rinse cycle. Again, you're not going to use a lot of electricity. And then also or auto water level adjustment. Because remember, if you use a large bundle, you're going to put a lot more water in there. It will wash a lot longer, and therefore um, that will also determine your electricity usage. Then if we look at our env environmental in check, um, impact, check your energy or water consumption rating. Obviously, if you buy something again that it's got an A++, Water consumption rating, you will pay a lot more for it, but it will be a good energy rating. Um, or um, note the eco-friendly packaging disposal, the fact that um, the packaging material has been made of biodegradable um, material. All right, the next one there is our stoves. So we've got our built-in stove with hob and oven. So you've got at the top, some schools have these stoves where the top is pulled into the counter stove and you've got your bottom oven. Um, most schools have this freestanding stove where it's a completely stove that you can just plug and play. And then we've got a gas stove with burners. That's what all the teachers want, that gas stoves with burners. If we look at our surfaces, um, the the, the built-in stove with the hob and oven has got a ceramic or a glass top that's easy to clean, but it needs some care. The freestanding stove has got solid or spiral plates. The spiral plates is usually in those two-plate two plate stoves. 
and then um, we've got gas burners with the gas stove. If we look at the heating, um, you have you can only use flat bottom pop pots in the um, built-in stove, and then the heating will vary by plate types. Remember, on grade ten, your teacher told you, told you that if you've got a big pot, then you will use the big stove plate, and a small pot, use the small stove plate, um, because that will also help with your energy um, savings, and then you will that will also determine the heating. The thing about a gas stove, it's got immediate heat um, and it's high heat effective. So um, you can, it will, your water will boil a lot quicker and your um, food can actually cook a lot quicker. Then if we look at the cleaning, um, it's easy to clean the, the gas uh, or the glass um, top, um, but you just have to be very careful because obviously it can crack. Um, the cleaning for the freestanding stove varies because you've got your spiral harder or your solid plate. It could be difficult to clean. And then um, the gas stove um, can be difficult to clean, um, but usually they make that those top ones can be removed um, and then it's easier to clean. Um, just a special note on the glass top, um, it may scratch or discolor. Um, and the thing about the freestanding stove is that the solid plate retains heat, so it does stay um, hot for a lot longer that you can't touch the, the top of well, the stove plates. And then um, it's very difficult to maintain low heat. So if you want um, the lowest heat on this gas stove, you have to turn the flame down um, a lot, and it's sometimes difficult to um, put it on like one, like on your freestanding stove. Right, there's a few key points when it comes to our human energy consumption. We want something that's easy to clean and that's got user-friendly control and display and something that's got clear instructions. Uh, we, we know how to put it on and you know how to put it off. Then we've got our non-human energy um, usage. Gas stoves are cheaper, so obviously you will save electricity. Um, most gas stove has got a gas stove at the top and it's got an electricity um, oven. Um, but you do also get gas stoves that's got um, gas at the top and at the bottom. Um, you've got a variety of plate sizes, so that will prevent energy wastage if you don't put on your big stove plate, um, if you only have a small little pot. Um, Self-cleaning ovens uses more electricity. Then if we look at our environmental impact, obviously gas stoves have got less impact on the electricity because it does use gas. Um, and then our induction hubs save energy. Just quickly on an induction hub, an induction hub looks like our glass tops. So it almost looks like that top over there the first time. Um, but the thing about an induction hub is it only gets heated up. So you'll turn it on and it will only heat up once you put a um, pot on it. And as soon as you take the pot off, it will immediately be cold again. So as soon as you put the pot on, it will immediately go on again. So that also saves a lot of electricity. All right, now we get to our fridges and freezers. Now that we've got a few different ones, we've got our side by side. So the entire one side is a fridge and the entire one side is a freezer. Um, or we've got a top and bottom freezer. So either the top, either the freezer is at the top or at the bottom and the fridge is either at the top or the bottom. And then we've got our freezers. We've got our upright freezers and our chest freezers. All right, if you look at the energy usage, the combination uses less than the side by side because the combination, if you only open the fridge side, only a little bit of cool air will escape. Um, where if you use the side by side, the entire one will, um, the, because you open the entire um, top to bottom, all the cold air will escape. Ice makers will also increase the usage. And then the manual defrost uses less electricity. So what does it mean? It's you opening up the, um, the fridge. Um, you'll turn off the electricity, you'll remove the food, and you will manually defrost it. So manually meaning you actually manually doing it. Manual defrost obviously requires more um, effort because you need to remove it all, you need to clean it, you need to put it off, the water will run out, um, it's quite messy, um, 
and it does use, but it does use less electricity. Um, and then the space efficiency also varies by models. Obviously, you can buy a small side by side or combination fridge or a larger one. Then if we look at our freezers, the chest uses less than the upright. So if you look at the chest freezer and you open up the chest freezer, it's only the top part that will, um, where the cold will escape. The bottom part will still be frozen, where if you open the, um, the upright um, freezer, because the entire door opens up, all the cold air will escape. Um, the upright freezer is obviously very convenient, um, easy to view, easy to organize. Um, cannot fit big things in though, where if you look at the deep freezer or the, the chest freezer, you can fit, fit in um, bigger items, um, but it's harder to organize and harder to access. Because if you lift up um, number one, it could be a heavy lid, so it's heavy to lift up and heavy to maybe keep open. And then um, if you want something at the bottom, you have to remove the, the baskets and you have to dig in deep to get the bottom things out. Um, so it could be difficult for older people to, to bend in there and to, so it's difficult to operate for them, um, hard to organize. Um, also, if you follow the, um, the FIFA method, then you want to put in your newest products right at the bottom. That means you need to unpack your freezer, put the new items at the bottom, and then repack your freezer. Um, the upright users is obviously more space efficient because you don't need a lot of space for that. All right. If we look at our fridges and freezers, the key points there. Got our human energy use. <clears throat> We've got no frost, it will save you time. So you you get the, the latest ones are all no frost. So um, it doesn't, uh, the, 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 the ice doesn't pack on the sides of the, the fridge or the freezer. Um, you can manually defrost, which is obviously time consuming. And then ice makers are also very convenient because you always have ice on hand. And if we look at our non-human, that's our electricity. Larger capacity obviously uses more electricity. So the bigger the freezer or the bigger the fridge, the more electricity it will use. Um, the auto defrost and ice makers increase usage. Um, so therefore, it will use a lot more electricity, the auto defrost and ice maker, because obviously ice must be made, so it uses a lot more electricity. And then the combination units are more efficient than um, side by side. Then if we look at our environmental impact, optimum temperature control saves energy. Um, while sealed doors prevent energy wastage, so make sure that the seal is intact so that there's no um, broken seal or maybe a space for um, warm air to come in. And then um, CFC-free units protects the ozone layers. Most new fridges and freezers are all CFC-free. Okay, then if we look at our microwave ovens, we've got two different ones. We've got our freestanding microwave and our built-in microwave. Um, if we look at our freestanding one, um, obviously both of them, you can use microwave to heat up food. The magnetron converts electricity to microwave, and then that's how it eats it up. Um, you can use 500 to 1,700 watts, um, and that will compare to uh, full size. Um, the higher wattage obviously heats up faster, but also uses a lot more electricity. So you will choose the size based on your family needs. So you can get from a 10 litre to a 50 litre microwave. Okay, if we look at the human energy, we know that um, a microwave does save time and effort, especially if you want to defrost something or if you want to cook vegetables or rice, um, it will go a lot quicker. It's easy to operate, easy to clean, you just wipe it down. Um, it also uses less electricity than the stove or the oven and it also shortens your cooking times. Um, and then because of that, it will also save time and electricity, so it will be good for the environment. All right, so now 
if we look at the financial responsibilities before and after buying, now, like we said, you will not close your eyes and pinpoint to a thing and then go buy that. There's lots of things that um, goes before that. You will first compare brands and shops. So you will go to macro, you will go to game, you will go to house and home. Um, and then you will look at the different brands, your LG, Samsung, no-name brands, cheaper brands. They import so many brands these days that you can buy um, cheaper brands as well. Then you will check your shop's reputation. You know that if you buy from the corner shop, you might not buy the best product. Um, it might not come with a warranty or a guarantee, um, and it might break and then you can't take it back. Then you also need to inquire about hidden costs. So hidden costs could be admin costs that goes with it or installation costs or um, delivery costs. Then you also need to understand the return or exchange policy. There's usually a time um, attached to that. So they will tell you that you only have um, two weeks to return it or it must be returned in a box. That's a mistake that I've made before. I've thrown the box away. And then clearly it says on there that you have to exchange it in the box in order to exchange it. So then um, you also need to review your guarantee terms. How long do you have before you can um, uh, return it? And then it's very important that you read your contract carefully, especially that small print. All right, you've now bought the item, you went to all the different shops, you've looked at all the different brands, and you bought a Samsung Micro from Game. The first thing that you will do is you will inspect for damages or defects, especially if it's delivered or it's in the box and it's not been opened yet. The first thing that you do, you cannot leave it um, because you're only going to use it over in a month's time and only open it in a month's time because that might be that the guarantee has expired and then you can't take it back. Make sure that you have a manual um, included and then read and follow all your instructions. Um, sometimes it tells you to, to wash without clothes first or to pre-rinse or to um, first put it on, put on the microwave without anything in there, whatever the case may be. Then you will test your appliance functionality. Does all the things work? You will store your documents safely and you will follow the proper complaint procedure if needed. You're not going to run to Hello Peter or put it in the newspaper. You will first go back to the shop or to the manufacturer. Right, now there's not, lots of different ways that you can buy a household appliance. And the most, the one that we know best is our cash transaction. And that is not just always physical cash. It could also be seen as a debit card or an EFT, that electronic funds transfer our COD, cash on delivery, or cash with order. That is all seen as a cash um, cash buy, um, and then you can ask for a cash discount. And that is an immediate or an advanced payment, like an upfront payment. And the shop knows that if you pay cash, they already have the money. They don't have to worry about anything else. The next one there is our credit transaction. We know that our credit transaction is more expensive um, because you pay a extra costs as well as um, your in interest that you're going to pay with that, your interest and your admin cost. Then a common one is also our installment sale or higher purchase. They talk about both in the question paper, so they can talk about an installment sale or a higher purchase, and it's in the name, installment sale. You pay it off in installments, or if you look at higher purchase, you hire it with the intent to buy it. So it only belongs to you, fully belongs to you, or after you've made that final payment. Um, then we've got our credit account or um, store account. Uh, or if we just quickly go back to our installment sale or higher purchase, um, you'll first sign a contract. Um, you will pay a deposit. Um, and you, you will pay um, ownership. You'll pay your sorry. You'll pay your monthly payments, and you only own it after you've made your final payment. Then, if we look at our lay by, 
Um, the item is reserved um, and you will pay a deposit um, and you will pay um, installments. There's no additional cost because remember, you do not pay um, interest. So therefore, there's no additional cost because the shop keeps the item until you've made the final payment. Then we've got our credit account or store account. Um, and that is the account um, that you will pay for, um, like say for instance, you have a Woolworths account or a macro account, um, and that will predetermine your spending limit. Um, you will pay a monthly minimum payment. Um, you will have monthly spending limit, and usually they give you um, the first 30 days interest free. So they can ask you um, any of those um, transaction types that you will pay, that you can use to pay for the appliance. All right. When we look at our contractual responsibilities, um, we look at the nature of the contract. Um, remember, it's always a legal document between the buyer and the seller. Um, we have the buyer's responsibility. Um, we need to understand um, that the contract fully before signing, so never just sign. Um, just give me two seconds, please. Um, so the buyer's responsibility um, and then some key contract information, what must be in the contract, the name and the address of both parties, the description of the goods, the um, cash transaction and additional cost. Uh, we need to pay a deposit, um, all your installment details like the amounts, the dates that you will pay, and then once you've paid your final payment, that date must also be there, um, and then your property rights clause must also be in there. All right, when we look at our rights and responsibilities of the consumer and the seller, so let's just quickly look at our consumer. Your rights is that you have the right to privacy. That's why we signed that Poppy Act. You have the right to product information, so they must give you all the information. You have the right to fair dealings. You have the right to a product choice. You have the right to inspect the goods before buying it. You have the right to quality and a warranty. And then very important that you have the right to return the rights. Then if we look at our um, responsibilities from the consumer, you have the responsibility for prompt payment. So you must pay, if it says that you must pay on the 30th, then you must pay on the 30th. Um, you have the responsibility to ethical behavior. You have the responsibility of handling of goods. You have the responsibility of environmental awareness and then fair dealings with the seller. If we go over to the seller, we have the right to debt um, recovery. So they must be able to recover their debt. They have the right to protection against theft. They have the right to advertise. They have the right to have respect and they have the right to protect their property. Then if we look at the responsibilities of the seller, they have the responsibility to regulate marketing, responsibility to clear information provision. They, can have fair, they must have the responsibility of fair contracts. They must adhere to the Consumer Protection Act. They have the responsibility to provide samples. Um, they have the responsibility to honor warranties. They have the responsibility to allow returns and they must prompt reimbursement. So if they owe you money or they must give you the product back, they must do it promptly. All right, let's quickly look at our exam questions. So let's open up there. We're going to look at the answers and the, um, please open up there. All right, 
So number one, you will get a piece of information. Now we know from that piece of information that uh, we need to get all the information from there. So study the information on the microwave oven and answer the questions that follows. So we have, there they give you all the information, 20 litre capacity, it's got a digital LED display with clock, 10 power levels, um, defrost by time, a weight, we've got a quick start, elegant mirror finish, user-friendly control panel, push button oven, gray interior. And then there they tell you it's a cash price. So if you pay the cash price, you'll pay that. But if you buy it on credit, you will pay 162 Rand per month over 36 months, and you have to pay a deposit over 200. So you're going to use all that information in your answer. 5.6.1, identify the type of credit transaction. So we can't say the cash price because cash price is not a credit transaction for one mark. And that is your installment sale or higher purchase. I always tell my learners um, that when we look at um, installment sale, I want you to think about the fridge because if your fridge breaks, when do I need the fridge? I need the fridge immediately. I can't wait another day because of my food products are going to go off. So when I look at my installment sale, number one, I am going to get, I need that fridge immediately. So I need to take it home today. I don't have 10, 15,000 rand to spend on a fridge. So therefore I'm going to pay it off. I just need a little bit of um, a little bit of money um, to pay a deposit. Um, so I will pay my deposit. I will take it home immediately. I will pay it off in installments, and the fridge only belongs to me once the final payment has been made. The only downfall of an installment sale transaction is. Like a cell phone, if your cell phone falls into the water or somebody steals your phone, you must finish paying for it. Same as a fridge. If somebody breaks in and they steal your fridge, you must still pay for that fridge because it only belongs to you once the final payment has been made. And another thing about that that we've learned in our um, the consumer about installment sale transaction is if... Um, they break in and they see that you must still pay for it. Um, and you um, it only belongs to you once the final payment is made. So also if it breaks off to the warranty period, you must still pay for it. Um, all right. Then we look at 5.6.2. It says describe how the functions of the microwave oven will benefit the consumer. So I need to describe the functions of the microwave oven and how it will benefit. So I need to look at the benefit. So it's a four mark question, but it's, um, yeah, so let's quickly look at that. Describe 20 litre capacity. Why is that important? Because it makes it big enough to cook larger meals. Um, these are now the functions that I'm looking at, and then I will say how it will benefit me. Defrost by time or weight accurately, so therefore I can um, defrost easily. Quick start and kitchen timer function, therefore it will save me time on electricity because it's got a quick start. Um, and then it obviously switches off automatically. It's got elegant mirror finish or gray interior which makes it easy to clean. So it's very important that I look at how does it benefit me? I can't just list the 20 liter capacity digital LED display. If I just wrote that, I, I would not have gotten the marks because I have to describe how those functions will benefit me as a consumer. So if we look at elegant mirror finish or gray interior, what does that have to do? It makes it easier to clean. Therefore, it benefits me as a consumer. Um, it's a user-friendly control panel. Therefore, makes it easy to, to use. It's got a push-button door. Therefore, easy to open. It's got a digital LED display with clock, which makes it easier to, to see the time. 
And then it's got a 10 power level, which makes it possible to cook a variety of dishes. So I can't just say 10 power levels, but I have to say it makes it possible to cook a variety of dishes because I've got different power levels. All right. Then if you look at 5.7, it says they read the statement below and answer the questions that follows. Now, I don't know anything about e-waste through electricity, um, ele electrical waste, but they give me a little scenario, so I need to use that. It says the e-waste or electronic waste is a term used for electrical household appliances that are discarded. So they are telling me that e-waste is when I discard electronic household appliances. E-waste contains recycled material like metal, glass, and plastic that can be reused to create new products. So I need to use that information. <clears throat> now, again, this is a higher cognitive question. So if we look at our, um, our verbs, it says they to analyze the positive impact. So I need, also need to talk about the positive impact of recycling e-waste. So what happens if I recycle e-waste on sustaining the natural environment? So I need to come out at the natural environment. So this is a two-mark question. I can't just talk about e-waste. I need to say, how does it sustain the natural environment? So when we look at that answer, this is a four-mark question. So this is actually a two-by-two. Two. Also look at, sometimes in a question paper, they can give you a two times two, then I need to explain or name something and explain. But in this case, I can establish that I also need to do that because of the nature of the answer I need to analyze. Okay, so now the first bullet there says the need to mine new raw materials is reduced. So I don't have to get new raw materials because there's already e-waste. There's already a microwave that I can use. And therefore, because I don't need to mine new raw materials, that will increase the sustainability and lessen the impact on the natural environment. Number two says less electricity or non-human energy will be needed to produce new products. So I'm not going to use a lot of electricity that is also your non-human energy. So I'm not going to use a lot of electricity because I don't need to produce a new product because I can recycle old parts and that will also lower my carbon footprint or my greenhouse effect. So can you see how I'm naming it and then linking it to the natural environment? Third bullet there, it may um, create less waste on landfill because those products are not landing on landfill sites, I'm putting it in that e-waste container in front of macro, and therefore less pollution, whether it be ground pollution or when they burn it, um, and it's also toxic. Then also it will reduce soil or water or air pollution because those things are not burnt when it comes into the landfill site because e-waste or hazardous, hazardous toxic waste, so we don't want to do that. So it's very important to please look at how they ask the question and then how to answer that question.